Let's pray. Heavenly Father, lead us into your word. Help us to hear what it is that you would say to us. Help us to remember um, your story, your love, your making of us, your redeeming of us, and your sustaining of us in every moment of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In preaching through the Bible in concert, with our through the Bible reading that some of us are doing, I decided that I wanted to spend a lot more time on the stories of Genesis than the speed of the through the Bible reading allowed. I, and I knew that that would work, and it would all work out because I knew that we were headed into some dense reading in Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and I also knew that dense reading makes for difficult preaching because it causes you to pick and choose certain verses out of the laws to preach from. Um, knowing, like all of us, we highlight the ones that we would rather preach from on or not preach from, and we end up picking and choosing. We find that there are some that are more important than others, and you end up doing all what we would rather do as opposed to um, facing the long lists of laws that are there. And exactly that, that's what we do, we pick and choose. And I didn't want to pick and choose, I just wanted to leave them all out. <laughs> and discuss them in Sunday school and in Bible study, which we've been doing. So from the pulpit, though, I want to spend time, as I have so far, on the narrative itself. right? And, and so we're about to catch up. By the end of March, we will have catched up, caught up, catch we will have caught up, and the readings that we'll be doing for the week will be very similar, at least close to what we are doing in, from the pulpit. Um, so far, we've looked at beats, bits and pieces, but looking at the major events and the major characters of Genesis up to now. And today, we turn our attention to the Exodus narrative, the story of Moses and the freeing of the Hebrew slaves from bondage imposed upon them by their Egyptian masters. Like Charlton Heston's Moses, whom we watched the other week, we will go before Pharaoh and say, let my people go. But in order to tell that story, we need to look at the transition that takes place from Genesis to Exodus. We need to look at what causes them to fall into slavery to begin with. When we left Joseph and his brothers, there were 12 tribes of Israel. They were living high on the hog in Egypt. Joseph was basically like the king. He was given office, he was given status, responsibility, and he was given any riches that he so desired. He made the Pharaoh quite rich in land. We see how the Pharaoh made best use of the crisis to take a bunch of land and riches he was able, Joseph was able to interpret the dreams and predict the famine, and this saved him, and it saved the kingdom. During the ensuing crisis, the Pharaoh and Joseph took tighter control of all of the surrounding regions. Joseph had done really well. But in the reading that Cheryl read for us this morning, we see the transition from this favored status to slave status. From the heights to the bottom. From the palace to the brick pits. From being adorned with riches to being covered in mud. From lavished with renown to being ripped and ravished by lashes and slave masters whips. When, why does this happen? How does this happen? What is the path to slavery? What is the road to serfdom? What is the route to ruin? What is the highway to hell on earth? The answer is frightfully simple. I say frightfully because it happens quickly, it's terrifying, and sadly it is a quite common occurrence. With time, it happens to the best of us. Both individually, when age catches up to us and we head into the kitchen to get something and we get there and have no clue what it is that we're looking for. Or collectively, it happens with the passage of time, we forget. 
That's the simple answer of what causes us to fall into slavery, and that is we forget. We do not remember. Important things are forgotten, and the world changes. What should have been remembered was lost. There came a pharaoh, a pharaoh in Egypt who didn't remember Joseph. That's how it happened. He didn't remember Joseph's name. He didn't remember Joseph's deeds. He didn't remember how Joseph had been his ancestor's right-hand man. He didn't remember that Joseph had saved the land. He didn't know that he owed his legacy, his title, his power, his throne to Joseph and to all that he had done. And what happens? He looks around him and sees people who are different from him. They're different in some way, and they are successful. Therefore, they are a problem. It's interesting that their success mirrors the very first commandment given in the Bible, which is to be fruitful and multiply. The people of Israel are fruitful and multiplying, and that is the problem. The question is, how are they different? It's hard to say. We see in the details much that would suggest that these tribes of Israel had become very much Egyptianized. They are year by year losing contact with the land that they have been promised. Why would they dream of going there when they have all that they would ever want here? It's not until things begin to go bad and they fall into those chains that they remember the old promises, the old covenants, the old God who to them bears the relational status as being the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. They get othered. And they become a threat. And threats must be put down. Rulers can't have such things happening around them. Never. But think about that. How these people cease to be connected to the why they are there. Even they have forgotten to some extent. They are just there and they are different. The past has been forgotten. Only the bad of the past or the bad, the difference remains. How does this happen? How does the past get forgotten, morphed, and changed? I have to give Clara credit. The other day she told a really funny joke. I don't know that she meant to. Um, I'm, I'm not totally sure how the joke worked, um, whether she was being serious or not, but it came out as a hysterical joke that said a lot, ir ironic, about the way that this world is today. She said, she likes to read fact books, like she likes to read things that have, you know, people think this, but this is really what's true, myth busters and, and, and that kind of stuff. So she was telling us about this one, and she said, did you know that George Washington didn't actually have wooden teeth? And I'm like, no. What, what did he have then? And she said, slaves. <laughs> and it, like I said, I don't know why she would make that joke. Like it doesn't fit her, her mindset. But talk about a hysterical thought about what is sometimes remembered about some of the greatest people who have ever lived. And what our culture is trying to do to remove the good parts of history and just remember the bad. It's funny because it's so sad. It's the sad reality of our times and the way history sometimes is being taught and remembered, right? If the biggest problem that we have is forgetting interesting the details we would choose to remember. It seems to me that George Washington did some other important things. We might want to remember and honor those things, like winning a war, leading men, being the first president elected, and also the first president to walk away from office when he didn't have to. Of all the things that we should remember, this being the most important, that George Washington was offered the kingdom and refused to be king. 
These are those important things to remember. They've done the same thing with Thomas Jefferson, right? Slave owner, of course, we need to remember that. We need to remember Sally Hemings. Not, we hold these truths to be self-evident, and certainly not this. With a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. That's the closing lines of the Declaration of Independence. How important those lines are. These are the things that we need to remember lest we fall to slavery. What is there? With firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. Divine providence is a major thing. It's the idea that God provides. In our times of need, God is there and provides. That we know God and that we know God provides for our needs. This is at the center of what we need to remember. This is the heart of what we need to remember lest we fall into slavery. And these are the very things that our future prospective slaveholders would want us to forget. For this is necessary. Is freedom, is freedom possible without the providence of God? The faith that is necessary to stand in the face of the future and not falter. Not to sell your freedom for slavery, the protection of a pharaoh who might promise you one thing one day and then sell you into slavery the next. At one point, you are the right hand of one pharaoh, the next pharaoh comes along and you are thrown into slavery. Why? Because he forgot. We do tend to forget, too, not the happy, convenient forgetting of the Pharaoh, but the worried, fearful, trading forgiveness of the unfaithful. We stand in the face of the future, and we forget what has brought us to that point. The hymn goes, O oh God, our help in ages past should be our hope for years to come, but it isn't. It just isn't. It isn't enough to keep us from being afraid. And it isn't enough to keep us from tra trading the beautiful risk of being free for the reliable chains of the slave. Even these very people when they are freed from the chains by Moses, as we see unfolding, it's actually in today's reading one of these, today's reading through the Bible in Numbers. These ones, these people, the ones whom the plagues of ravished the Egyptians in their sight, the ones for whom the Red Sea parted, the ones for whom there was a pillar of fire and the cloud leading them day by day and night to night. Even them who had seen all of this with their own eyes. They're not reading in a book. They're seeing it happen in front of them. But seeing it for themselves. Even they who had seen all of these wonders, they get into the desert and they say it over and over again. It doesn't just happen once. It happens many times. Why did you lead us here to die in the desert? Which is, why did you let me be free to make these choices that are bad for me? We're better off as slaves because at least then we can eat. And God gave them manna. We're better off as slaves because at least then we did not thirst. And God gave them water out of a rock. We were better off as slaves because at least then we had meat to eat, and God gave them quail. Why did you bring us out here, Moses, with all of these rules, so you could be ruler over us, so you could be like Pharaoh, so you could put us in these chains? Let us go back. All the while, Moses is praying prayer after prayer of intercession, begging God to forgive them. They forget, and they are witnessing it all in real time, and they still forget. 
We're going to get to Deuteronomy eventually. It seems to put all of this stuff so much more succinctly and, 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 and in good context. The entire book is a sermon. And one warning the people of Israel to remember, to remember, to remember, and to never forget. Why? Because when things get bad and when crisis comes, you need to remember that God has gotten you through it before. And, you, and, and will again. God has gotten you through it before and will again. And when you forget that, and you will, you turn to everything other than God. Things you can see, things that you can touch, things that others are using. And these things become your gods. Because they replace God in your heart and you put your faith and trust in Him instead. In that sense, the speaker of that is Deuteronomy, and the you is all of us. Me included. We forget. <clears throat> Even the disciples forget. I chose the reading that Cheryl read from Mark. It could have been any of the many chapters in Mark. Mark, as we remember from when I preached it a, year, a few years ago, it almost parallels this journey through the desert. The twelve tribes being like the twelve disciples. Don't you remember that this was the resounding takeaway that it seemed like I was preaching the same thing week after week? The disciples see miracle after miracle, and each time the next opportunity for a miracle arises, the next crisis that comes, the next problematic situation, and they don't forget, they don't remember. They forget. It doesn't compute in their heads that these things are connected. The feeding of the 5,000. Wow, that was pretty amazing, Jesus. But then they're on the storm at the sea and they're frightened out of their minds and they're blaming Jesus. How could you let this happen? To the feeding of the 4,000. The walking on the water. Every time, the disciples were newly amazed because their faith did not attach things together any more than the Israelites watching the Red Sea part did. It's the same story, and it's the same story in our lives as well. We've been brought to this point by the hand and the grace of God, but yet we still are fearful of the moment and of the future. Enough to forsake what God promises and to do something else instead. To choose something else for ourselves to protect us. We can talk about the sadness that we feel over the removal of history all around us, right? From statues coming down and the insanity that wishes to change and erase the past and make us not remember it. And I hate it too. It's so foolish. It's, it, people are ridiculous. But it's not just them. The very one thing that we need to remember at every moment in our lives is the first thing that we forget, and that is that God has led us to this point and will continue to lead us through. God's presence is real and important and full and whole and true. Why do we forget? Think about every time that I walk into that chicken coop. And I've walked into that thing probably 40 times. The girls have done it hundreds of times. I've done it like 40 times because I don't even want to even think about going in there. I don't like it. Because I might step on a snake. Or one of them chickens might fly past my head, which is even worse. I'd rather step on thousands of snakes and just feel that wind from their wings. Ugh. But I've stepped into that coop every time 
and I'm afraid of a snake that I've never seen. It's amazing how the human mind can invent things to be afraid of. Despite the fact that we live on a planet that's exactly the right distance from the sun. And the perfection that is all around us, the miracle of our very existence. And the fact that chocolate and peanut butter have bound themselves together <laughs> for us. And that we can boil water and make coffee. Or not boil it and just let it brew for a couple of days and like then it doesn't have that acid that eats at our stomach. I mean, the perfection of things around us is just amazing. And yet, we still forget and we choose other things than the source to be thankful for and to protect us in the next moment. All through Deuteronomy, Jesus or Moses tells them, always remember, don't forget, and be wary of the fact that you will be liable to trade everything that you've been shown about God in the moment of crisis. You'll do it. And be wary of that. You'll even do it in moments of ease. Maybe the moments of ease are that much better. It's like, because it just kind of sneaks in there and you've traded this away and you never thought it was God. You just traded it and then next thing you know that crisis does come and you're Foundation is something other than God. Christ gives for us this table and invites us to the table of communion. And the two things that he says each time, whether it's the cup or whether it's the bread, he says, do this in remembrance of me. Now, rituals are an interesting part of religious life. Right? Do this ritual, do this, do that, do other. Rituals to change things, a rain dance, throwing a virgin into a volcano lest it not erupt. These things that we do, but one of the things that we forget is that the doing of things is also connected to memory. The good side of ritual is that. And when Jesus invites us to this table, he's inviting us to do this thing so that we will remember what are we remembering? That God is providing us bread. That God has forgiven our sin. And that each of us are invited, not by anyone else, but by Jesus Christ himself. Showing the love that God has. May we prepare to come to this table in hopes that we can connect the memories that are symbolized in this meal with the providence that God gives us in our daily lives and especially in those times of need.